Okay, let's try another practice exam. This first question uh, is, uh, we've got this uh, starting material and we're going to do, what is this? We've got ozone, so we're gonna do ozonolysis. So when we do ozonolysis, we know that we're going to cleave pi bonds, right? We're gonna cleave that. And uh, since we're gonna be opening up this ring, let's go ahead and number our carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We better have a seven carbon linear product. So let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then on carbon three, right, with ozonolysis, each of the carbons that was participating in the pi bond is now a carbonyl carbon. So on carbon three, we had a secondary, right, this will be a secondary carbon, and so we've got to have a ketone there. And then on four, five, six, seven, on this terminal one, well, we've got to make sure we know what kind of workup we're doing. This is reductive workup, and so with reductive workup, we know that that is going to be an aldehyde. If this were oxidative workup, we would have a carboxylic acid. So. Uh, ozonolysis, we cleave this pi bond, pull this apart into a linear molecule, and then we've got to have two carbonyls. One is a ketone, one is an aldehyde. So there's our ozonolysis. Okay, next one, we've got a little bit of a synthesis here. So we've got this terminal alkene, and then we've got this ether. We're trying to make an ether. So which ways do we know how to make an ether? Well, there's Williams and ether synthesis. That's one way to do it. Um, and so we know we're going to have to grow this molecule. We're going to have to add additional uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon material to it. And we know we need an oxygen. We need to add oxygen functionality. So how are we going to do that? Well, why don't we just do, we, we know that or, so we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six on this sixth carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, we need oxygen. So we probably need to do some anti-Markovnikov chemistry. We might want to do an anti-Markovnikov hydration. So that would be, uh, that would be first BH3 in THF, and then we need our peroxides to promote the anti-Markovnikov chemistry in hydroxide, and that is how we are going to get the anti-Markovnikov hydration product, because now we have an alcohol, and alcohols are the substrate for Williamson ether synthesis. So we can now do Williamson ether synthesis. How do we do that? Well, we know that sodium hydride is a great way to deprotonate this, uh, this alcohol, so we get the oxyanion, and then we can just react. We need uh, we need two more carbons. We need two more carbons on there. So let's just have this react with ethyl bromide, right? We know that we're just going to do quick SN2, pop two more carbons on there. So that's all Williamson ether synthesis is. We're just deprotonating the alcohol, having it uh, act as an SN2 nucleophile on an alkyl halide. But we had to do anti-Markovnikov hydration in the way of uh, hydroboration oxidation in order to get that uh, alcohol substrate for Williamson ether synthesis. So basically a two-step quick little uh, synthesis there. Okay, next one, we're going to do two reactions. So first we're going to do, we're going to use lithium aluminum hydride. So what does that do? Well, lithium aluminum hydride is a source of hydride. So that's going to attack. We know that if we reduce a ketone, we get an alcohol, right? So we reduce a ketone, we get an alcohol, and now we've got dilute aqueous hydrochloric acid. So when it's dilute, that just means it's catalytic. So we've got to protonate something. We know we're going to protonate that hydroxyl. And now we have a good leaving group. We have water molecule. That is a good leaving group. So we can go ahead and uh, take a proton and because this is aqueous, right, if this is aqueous, we know that this is going to be a good, uh, a good idea, right? If, we, we, if we've got aqueous acidic conditions, water is able to protonate. So water being very unhindered will go for the internal proton here, and we're going to kick that off. This is basically an E1 elimination, so, uh, or sorry, an E2, sorry, E2 elimination D, E2D, basically. Uh, we're doing this somewhat in E2 fashion, and uh, we're going to get this product, right? So what did we do? Uh, first, we did a reduction to get the alcohol, and then with dilute aqueous acidic conditions, we protonate the hydroxyl, make it a water molecule, make it a good leaving group, and then water, which there's plenty of water in there, and in acidic conditions, able to protonate. Since it's unhindered, went and got the proton from the more substituted carbon so that we could produce the Zeitzef product, 
which is the more substituted and more thermodynamically favorable product, which is going to be this alkene here. So uh, that is going to be that. Uh, that's going to be that one. Okay, next up we've got this alkene and we've got MCPBA. It should actually be a lowercase m. Uh, Metachloroperoxybenzoic uh, acid. And so we know that this is uh, the way that we, that we achieve epoxidation. We're going to make an epoxide out of this. So what do we do? We just take the substrate as is. And then uh, we know that we're going to, uh, so we can do this however we want. We just have to use a wedge and dash bond. So let's say that we put the oxygen on the wedge right there. Well, then we just have to put the other methyl on the dash right there. So we do have to show the appropriate stereochemistry. But this is just asking if we know that this reagent is for epoxidation. So we're going to make an epoxide, toss the oxygen on there. That's all there is to it. Okay, some multiple choice. Assuming that no rearrangements occur, how many primary mechanistic steps exist in the E1 dehydration of an alcohol when it is treated with concentrated sulfuric acid? So uh, if we're doing E1D, this is an E1 de uh, dehydration, step one is protonation, right? We're going to protonate that hydroxyl group. Uh, we've got acid in there, right? Sulfuric acid is going to protonate the hydroxyl group. Uh, step two uh, so E1, E1 means that leaving group leaves. So uh, water has to leave, right? We've protonated the hydroxyl. Now we have a water, uh, water molecule that can act as a leaving group. So in E1D, water leaves. And then step three, that's when we get pi bond formation. Right, it is an E1 dehydration, it is an elimination, so we're gonna get a pi bond there, but it does have to happen in these three discrete steps. So this is a three-step process. Okay, next, which of the following alkenes is the most stable? So we've got one hexene, that would be this. Then we've got uh, E2 hexene, so that would be this, E because these higher priority groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. And then 2-methyl-2-pentene. So 2-pentene and also 2-methyl. So this is a mono-substituted uh, alkene. This is a di-substituted and this is a tri-substituted, right? Because if we're going to, we're, gonna, we're talking about one alkyl group. Here we're talking about two alkyl groups. And here we're talking about three alkyl groups that are attached to the two carbons participating in the pi bond. So uh, with stability, uh, the more the, the greater the degree of substitution, the more stability, uh, the more stable it is for reasons of hyperconjugation. So tri-substituted is the most substituted and therefore the most stable. So it's gonna be that one. Now, which of the following compounds has the largest molecular dipole moment? So let's identify any bond dipoles. So right here, carbon fluorine carbon fluorine, uh, here also carbon fluorine, carbon fluorine, and carbon bromine, carbon bromine. So what do we understand here? Uh, well, the, here we have two, uh, two bond dipoles, but they are precisely opposing one another, right? So they do cancel each other out, so we have a net dipole of zero. This, uh, this will be nonpolar overall. Over here, we do get, uh, we do get a slight overall dipole, in one direction because there they ha there is a there is a component of each vector that is pointing in one direction and so when we do the vector addition they come together and point slightly up however bromine versus fluorine bromine is not particularly polar in fact the electron uh, sorry bromine is not particularly electronegative it is almost the same electronegativity as carbon so these carbon bromine bonds are not especially polar they are polarizable which is why uh, alkyl bromides do chemistry but they're not very polar bonds so this is not a strong net dipole uh, but carbon fluorine bonds are very polar because fluorine is the most electronegative uh, element. And so this is going to be a much stronger uh, net dipole than this one. Okay, we're going to use, okay, we need to do some IUPAC nomenclature and we've got this alkyne. So how do we do this? Well, we've got the longest carbon chain. That's pretty much already written for us, but we do have to number it. So we need to number it so as to give the alkyne, the triple bond occurring soonest. So we got to go one, two, three, four, five, 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If we went right to left, it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 where it started. Now, do remember, these are carbons right here, right? Alkynes are, uh, the carbons in the alkyne are sp hybridized uh, uh, and therefore exhibit linear molecular geometry. So these are carbons right here, and uh, we do have to understand that. Okay, so what do we have? Uh, well, all we have, that's pretty much it. We have, uh, we have a four uh, decine and we have eight methyl, uh, but we do have to assign the absolute configuration at that stereo center. This is a stereo center. And so let's draw in the implied hydrogen. We know that that is gonna be priority four, but then the rest we have carbon, 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 those all tie. So carbon is attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. That will actually be the lowest priority of the three. Here we have a hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. So we're still tied. And then over here, carbon is attached to hydrogen, 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 carbon. So this is actually priority one, and this is priority two. We do have the lowest priority group already away from us, so let's just go one, two, three, like that, and we know this is S. So that's all we need. We have a three S, uh, no, sorry, not three, uh, that is eight. This is carbon eight, uh, eight S, eight, methyl four decine and that's all there is to it and uh, that's the end of this exam thanks for watching guys subscribe to my channel for more tutorials support me on patreon so i can keep making content and as always feel free to email me professor dave explains at gmail.com